Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Adriana Farmiga. I am the Associate Dean in the School of Art here at the Cooper Union. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program as part of our continuing series of public art fund talks at the Cooper Union. These talks are organized around New York City exhibitions like the one we'll learn about in just a moment. Exhibitions that present socially relevant, groundbreaking artwork to a wide audience. We are thrilled, as always, to be working with the Public Art Fund to make this kind of free programming possible. They are an organization with whom the Cooper Union shares a long-standing commitment to the fundamental power of democratizing art and making creative discourse accessible to all. I am particularly excited to celebrate tonight's featured exhibition, which I think raises issues both urgent and always present in thinking about connections to land and water, and how those connections persist against the divisions of political borders and colonial interests. Questioning and advancing important issues like these has been central to Cooper Union's mission as a public forum for more than 164 years. We were fortunate enough to host a virtual lecture by tonight's guest artist, Nicholas Galanin, in 2020 at the height of the pandemic, and we are enormously grateful to Public Art Fund for inviting him back to Cooper Union to be with us in person this evening. Now, to introduce our featured artist and share a little more about his new exhibition, I have the pleasure and privilege of handing things over to Public Art Fund's artistic and executive director, Nicholas Bohm. Thank you, Nicholas. Adriana, thank you so much um, for the warm welcome. As always, it's a, it's a thrill to be here at Cooper Union in person. Uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us in, in this really uh, signature series um, that's been uh, an, an important part of really, as Adriana said, creating this dialogue, bringing public art the dialogue around public art um, to this kind of uh, very broad audience and students. It's, of course, all the more fitting to begin tonight with a land acknowledgement, um, since we are talking uh, about land, thanks to, to Nicholas Galanin, um, and learning uh, from indigenous and Native American ways of thinking about the environment and land. Uh, and we offer our gratitude to the Lenape, the original people of this land, and also acknowledge the genocide and removal of the Lenape nations from Lenape Hoking, their homeland. And we honor the many First Nations people who continue to live and work in this region today. I want to say a quick word of thanks to our uh, sponsors of Public Art Fund Talks, uh, Con Edison, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York uh, City Department of Cultural Affairs, and of course the amazing Public Art Fund Board who support everything that we do, and, uh, and of course our amazing team, uh, and the team here at Cooper, as well as the Public Art Fund team, and in particular, Gabby Lopez Dana, our amazing um, uh, public practice associate curator who puts together this program uh, and others inspired by the exhibition. I'm very excited to say that this is Nicholas's first public art commission in New York City. In every language there is land, in cada lengua hay una tierra, and it's in Brooklyn Bridge Park until next year, uh, late March. And uh, this is also the first commission in Brooklyn Bridge Park by Public Art Fund of a Native American artist. Nicholas is uh, a member of the Sitka tribe of Alaska, where he lives and works with his family on Lingit Ani. He is a skilled practitioner of subsistence in his homeland and creates art 
rooted in his perspective as an indigenous man con connected to the land and culture to which he belongs. His multi-layered practice seeks to envision and support indigenous sovereignty as it also advocates for social and environmental justice. Many of Nicholas's most ambitious and powerful works are in the realm of public art. Tonight, he'll talk about his engagement with public art, as well as, uh, in, in particular, creating this work in Brooklyn Bridge Park. It's an extraordinary and immersive sculpture that speaks on so many levels about past and present, our relationships with the physical environment, and the legacies of colonization and their impact on, on migration and so many other things. Nicholas, um, I mean, he's really quite overqualified. He has uh, a BFA from London, Guildhall University in jewelry design, an MFA in indigenous visual arts from Massey University in New Zealand, and he apprenticed with, uh, before that, master carvers and jewelers in his community. He's represented here in New York by Peter Blum Gallery, uh, and his music is released by Sub Pop Records in Seattle. Uh, he is going to share uh, with us, um, of course, uh, images and, and uh, talk about his work for the next sort of 55 minutes or so. Uh, please join me in, um, well, no, actually before that, let me just give a little plug that this is um, part of a series of programs that explore land and borders from different perspectives, sort of inspired by Nicholas's exhibition. And in fact, the posters that you hopefully received during check-in um, were co-designed by Mobile Print Power and Queen's residents who shared their experiences of borders across social, cultural, and political spaces. And they were printed at Brooklyn Bridge Park next to Nicholas's commission. All right, now let's welcome Nicholas Galanon. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name's Yehi Atsin, I'm Nicholas Galanin, I'm Flipnahadi, child of the Kaguantan people of Sitka. Uh, really great to be here in person. I know we, we had a COVID moment where everybody was speaking on Zoom, so good to see you all. Uh, I want to start by sharing some images of where I come from. Um, this is Chief Ka. This is my ancestral homelands. Um, my community, the land, the water, truly shapes us. It shapes our connection to place. It shapes our understanding of where we come from, where we'll go when we leave this realm. It shapes uh, how we care for our uh, community how we survive, and uh, I live a life in my community where we follow the, the, the calendar seasons of salmon returning or of uh, the herring run, and when the, when the berries come through, or, you know, those, that's our calendar and that's our clock, and we can't really schedule it or wait for it based on capitalist calendars that most of us are, adhere to in today's reality. Uh, for me, that's truly important part of understanding, uh, not just where I come from, but understanding how we all uh, connect to something. And, and without that connection, there's possibility for a deep disconnect. Uh, and with that disconnect, um, get to fall into conversations with some of these works that I'm going to share with you today that 
colonization and other aspects of this, this world and history have uh, put us through. This is readout. This is a sockeye salmon run every June to maybe July, late June, July, even into August. The sockeye come through uh, in Klinket culture, Poots, who you'll see on the back of the log here, uh, brown bear, taught us how to survive on the land. Um, and we fish with them. Um, and they take our fish if they want to. <laughs> but uh, we try to give them space. So um, it's a really important part of uh, the year. I subsist. I don't like the word subsist, actually. I, you know, sustain through sustenance and harvesting. Uh, enough uh, fish, venison, and you know, other, other uh, seasonal harvests from the land to, to sustain not just my family, but you know, probably about 10 families in, in total with you know, extended family, etc. So it's, it's, um, it's where we come from. This is uh, the smokehouse. My late father, smoking salmon, of course, our recipe is the best. You can ask him. <laughs> but there's a, there's a process and a method to, to understanding these things. Um, the training that I have as a, a caretaker of this culture is not just the visual work. It's not just, um, it's, it's more than that. It's continuum and generations and sharing that um, and understanding, looking back, moving forward. The image here I want to share with you um, represents an era of that time period. Um, this is a fish camp in, um, near Juneau in Douglas and the uh, camp was intentionally burnt down by the city of Juneau to displace um, the tribal community, um, to remove not only their homes, all their items, uh, and make way for a boat harbor. Um, this was done in 1962. So I'm going to speak to you a little bit about uh, land and colonization. Um, it's not a thing of the past. It's continual. We're still we're still facing that in this in this world in many ways. Um, this was our this was was and is and continues to be versions of it in, in our communities. Um, the summer of '62, Douglas Island Village was burnt by the city of Douglas. Um, the city seized control of the village, burned homes, household belongings, fishing boats, net storage. All the tribal members were forced to relocate without any compensation for their lands, houses, fishing gear, personal possessions, or, and without the financial ability to secure or build new homes. Um, in 2016 or 17, I was um, asked to be the lead carver on a 42 foot pole for the Taku Kwan, the Taku community in Juneau. Um, to put up on site, in that village site. Um, this, for me, I speak of it as life work. I've been training um, since I was young to, to carve and do this cultural work in our communities. And I feel grateful that I'm able to be here doing this now. This was the first totem where I was solely the lead carver. Um, I had six apprentices. It was a healing totem pole. So, uh, highlighting the Yanyeti history of that community, uh, the healing took place in a process. The healing took place through the process of sharing, passing on this visual language to apprentices who will uh, continue to do this work. Uh, it took place through 
voicing through protocol, through dance, through ceremony. Um, the elders in the story represented in, in this work. Uh, at the raising of this totem, there's a gentleman in front of the traditional boom truck <laughs> that uh, was in, in a black shirt. He was a child when the village was, was burned down. So there was an immense um, joy to see this history represented, this um, history of the land shared through our uh, through our visual language, this is you know this art form is uh, an ancestral, ancient visual language that we still use to document history, to um, pass on knowledge, to to represent cultures that are alive and living. Um, these totems will stand; and they will fall back to the earth, um, and the knowledge lives within us, generationally, it lives. And that's, that, to me, ensures, you know, the health of a community in a lot of ways. Um, so I feel like this is life work. I feel like uh, participating in it um, is, you know, I, I was born into it amongst artists. My father was a uh, cultural artist, culture bearer, my uncle, my mentor. My daughter is learning to carve right now, which is really, really uh, special for me to see. Uh, this last project here, too, I wanted to share is, is um, a yacht, a canoe. Again, one of the first ones that I was able to be lead carver on. And um, the image above is the Western Red Cedar old growth tree, which is older than America. And, I would estimate this tree was probably 600 years old, maybe. The timeline of indigenous understanding, indigenous technology, indigenous um, continuum transfer of our practice, our knowledge, our language, a lot of that deeply disrupted intentionally through genocide, through colonization. Um, a lot of that continues to live on in, in these works. So yes, this is a canoe, but it's also a technology. It's also a deep understanding and connection to place and these canoes connected us to communities through trade, through um, harvesting, through visiting other spaces for ceremonies, um, and the practice still continues. Part of this care for culture uh, includes many things beyond just the, the process, the tools, the material. It also includes caring for land and the, and the old growth, in this case, red cedar. And red cedar is becoming less and less common and accessible in our communities due to capitalism, due to logging. Uh, clean water is also becoming less and less accessible in communities due to mining, due to other aspects of uh, capitalism and colonization. Today's October 18th. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here with you and not in Alaska um, on this day because it's Alaska Day and my community uh, really goes overboard in celebrating Alaska Day. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what that is. Um, this is Seward. Uh, Seward purchased Alaska from Russia. Um, and this bronze monument statue was erected in 2017 in front of the uh, Alaska government building in Juneau, the capital, at a time where a lot of bronzes were being questioned of whose history is being represented and upheld. A lot of bronzes were being removed or were about to be removed internationally, I think. Um, the conversation around Alaska Day in my community and the transfer of Alaska took place literally behind my old studio. Uh, and every uh, 
October 18th, a certain community will ceremoniously reenact it. Um, let's go here real quick. So this is purposefully upside down, but this is the reenactment of Alaska Day as we see it. And it wasn't until recently that our indigenous communities were, you know, they reached out and shared perspectives of, of this uh, reenacting of the selling of unceded land in, in Alaska. All of Alaska is unceded. Um, all of the communities there, some communities fought and faced directly with colonization, with Russians, with Klingit, and our communities were at war with Russians. Um, this image here is a collaborative redesign of the state seal. Uh, if you look at a lot of the seals and state seals of Alaska, was, uh, or of many states, including Alaska, you'll see a lot of imagery that uh, highlights, I guess, colonization. The redesign of this was a project my friend John Gurley from Portugal, the man, the band, reached out um, on this image's um, Cat Man, Kiksadi chief from Sitka, who you know battled during this time and during this displacement of, of our communities, um, literally in our hometown. So, anyways, I'm grateful to be away from some of that and be here with you all on this day. Um, that Seward bronze statue that I shared with you. Um, that went up in 2017, sparked a larger conversation and project in, in Juneau, which is north of my community. And, uh, sea Alaska Heritage is a cultural heritage foundation um, that does a lot of work within Thinkit, Simshian, and Haida communities. Um, founded Alongside ANCSA, which is the Alaska Native Land Claims Act, if you know much about different cultural histories of um, indigenous relationships to place and land, Alaska, at the time of this transfer, um, had landless indigenous communities. We still have landless indigenous communities. Um, the pipeline was trying to get pushed through. This is a really short version of it. And the a lot of the indigenous communities banded together to try to secure some access to our ancestral homelands. With that, ANCSA was pushed through. With that, we were not placed in reservations, which are internment camps. Uh, we were given shares, shares to corporations, native corporations, um, that we still have and hold. And those shares, some of those corporations participated in economies to stay alive through timber. Some of them failed. Uh, some of them continue to invest and in, invest in culture. And um, complications of that is that we've been forced into a relationship with land through capitalism. We've been forced into um, getting not only that, also forcing blood quantum, which is also a form of genocide, removing our um, authenticity or and maintaining it, this idea of purity, um, in contrast to the one drop rule, which is another version of um, oppressive um, connections to people's cultures, lineage, and past. Um, so I hold shares. I hold shares in Sea Alaska Heritage. I hold our Sea Alaska Corporation. I think I get three hundred dollars a month for that. Or no, a year. Sorry, big difference. She <laughs> uh, I hold some shares, and I get maybe a hundred dollars a year, two hundred. I don't get access to my land. I don't get access to fish camps. I don't have those things. Those are very, you know, you have to get to that by maybe purchasing legal title to, to place. Um, See Alaska Heritage, now doing cultural work as a nonprofit offshoot of Sea Alaska Corporation, um, does amazing 
amazing important work with language revitalization, with culture camps, with publications, um, with NAGPRA and the ability to repatriate our objects that have been um, stolen from our communities. If you walk through most of these museums, the MAT, American Museum of Natural History, uh, British Museum, kind of endless array, there'll be thousands of objects and and remains, ancestors, and our human remains from our ancestors in those collections and in those spaces. And in order to get those back, you have to bureaucratically go through, at least in the U.S., NAGPRA, which is a, a repatriation claim, and you have to show that you can care for those objects. Uh, the irony of that is that these places might provide care for these via humidity, but they do not spiritually to the, to the objects and ancestors in those spaces. See, Alaska has a humidity temperature control place now too, so we can start getting some of those back. Um, with Seward bronze statue going up in Juneau in 2017, um, the, this project kicked off. And it was the um, it was the Kutia Dea Dei Kutia Dei, which is a totem pole trail. It's the Alaska Institute begun commissioning uh, thirteen poles to start in response to this Seward Bronze statue to go up all through the capital. Uh, they're trying to do thirty. I was asked to do. Uh, one, and we just raised this in May. It's a Kaguantan totem, so it's my father's clan, and this is where it stands now in Juneau. Um, and there will be 30. It transformed the city immediately. Um, and in representing, our, in representing the history of this place, in allowing for a Carvers from several communities to do these projects. Um, the, te the temperature of knowledge of what work is being done in spaces, and it trained new carvers along the way. Uh, there's, I don't think there's been any work on this scale in our communities uh, in recent times um, of commissioning such work. It was at Mallon Foundation, I believe, New American Monuments, um, to to kick this project off, and it's still ongoing. So. Twenty twenty, Seattle protests. This is um, I, I, this this image really s striking for me. That's Rick uh, Rick Williams in the photograph, um, brother of John T. Williams. John T. Williams was murdered by a Seattle police officer Ian Burke, August thirtieth, two thousand ten. So ten years later, during. Uh, Protests that were sweeping globally, I would say, with um, condemning extrajudicial uh, murders that continue to happen in this nation. John T. Williams was a wood carver that was ca crossing the street in Seattle with his totem pole and knife, carving knife in hand, and was shot four times in the back by this officer. Statistically, Native Americans are the highest risk of being killed by police officers. Precedent for this behavior has been well established throughout the history of the United States, in which military, cavalry, settlers legally protected and often rewarded for murdering indigenous men, women, and children. Neon American Anthem White. This work was recently. Um, installed and is on exhibit currently at the Seattle Art Museum. Um, this was a work where I was asked to engage with the contemporary American galleries of that space. Um, and I wanted to create work that um, engaged with institution in general, engaged with these walls and collection practices. Um, oftentimes, contemporary American collections do not hold any 
indigenous artists at all in conversation. And next to this installation in the room next to it is um, uh, a room of indigenous objects, indigenous at who, cultural objects that belong to communities. The same community from the totem that I raised that was burnt to the village, there's a clan hat that belongs to them that's in that collection still. So this work engages all of their collections and these collection practices. Neon sign on the wall reads, I've composed a new American national anthem, take a knee and scream until you can't breathe. The work creates an intersectional space for catharsis, to mourn the loss of lives, freedoms, and safety for people and lands subjected to American violence, and to protest continuing oppression. The unsigned embodies capitalism, its text pointed reference to the murders of Eric Garner, George Floyd, Tyree Nichols, and all people of color who have been murdered at the hands of police and agents of the American state, asking participants to take a knee as a position of Deference turned refusal to scream until you can't breathe encompasses protest aimed at tearing down the systems built to enforce whiteness, white privilege, heteropatriarchy, and capitalist control. There's uh, currently got an exhibition at Site Santa Fe, a solo exhibition called Interference Patterns, up till February, and there's a red version of this work that's installed there. Uh, beyond I don't know that's the same as a neon American anthem red, and there's one more blue version that may be installed in Philadelphia soon. I'm working on the details of that. Shadow on the land and excavation and bush burial. Uh, in 2020, I was invited to visit Australia, um, visit Sydney. Actually, it was probably 2018 or 19 when I was up there. Um, to participate in the 2020 uh, Biennale in Sydney. My research brought me to the Kiwi Islands. Uh, that was an incredible experience. Kiwi Islands is north of Darwin, where actually the first landing took place in Australia. Not, um, not the myth of James Cook and the discovery plaque that you will see on the Statue and monument in Hyde Park in Sydney. Um, while I was out there, I was also preparing for another version of these colonial holidays that often include reenactments, etc. Um, and for this, it was the 250th anniversary of Cook, Cook Landing. And Cook also traveled through uh, Alaska as well. I wanted to do a work that um, represented this history and our relationship to these monuments and these spaces. So, Shadow on the Land and Excavation and Bush Burial is an excavation of the shadow cast by the Captain Cook statue in Sydney's Hyde Park. Following tracing and transfer of the shadow to the site, careful excavation retains the shadow shape, reveals what the land holds beneath. The Cook Monument's shadow is an embodiment of the shadow of greed, pollution, destruction, cast on the land by corporate capitalist colonization and settlement. By creating a hole large enough to bury the statue, the work's excavation, along with its title, suggests the burial of the Cook Monument itself, along with the burial of destructive governance and treatment of indigenous land, indigenous people, and indigenous knowledge. Throughout the dig, small flags are placed marking evidence of indigenous presence preceding Cook's arrival. The excavation of the colonial shadow by an indigenous artist using scientific practice of archaeology as an art medium turns a practice that originates with colonizers' belief in white supremacy to delivering a layered critique and call for change. The resulting earthwork presents an opportunity to prepare for the burial on land designated as a prison by colonizers of the Cook Monument itself. <clears throat> Along with the burial of governance and legislation casting shadows of erasure, pollution, violence against indigenous lives and knowledge. Um, part of this work that's important to me too and the title of it was, and I wanna reference it, and I don't think I have a photo of it here, was, is the um, 
excavation and bush burial. And bush burial is a reference to Frederick McCuban painting that I saw in one of the museum collections while I was out there. Uh, it was a painting by done in 1890. It was fabricated and romanticizing the settler body being embedded into Aboriginal land, uh, into the, the history and conquest. Um, and I wanted to reference that in this work. This was the monument in Sydney, and obviously this is the response. Um, anytime that there's protest or these monuments are contested, oftentimes this is something that you know we would see. And I, I know we've seen versions of this here at the American Museum of Natural History in New York with the um, Roosevelt bronze that was recently removed. Um, I recall seeing the barriers around that and of course, law enforcement. I don't know what year this was, maybe 2021, 2021. Uh, it was during, during COVID shutdown, so speak a little bit about the experience of being out here, uh, the being out here city, Sydney and the opening for this. Um, the world was rapidly shifting to uh, COVID as we all experience and are reminded of that blur of time. Um, I was supposed to be traveling to, I was supposed to be here in New York, and then I was supposed to be in Portugal. Um, all, all of these trips were canceled. The Biennale of Sydney continued, and you know, un, uncertain, we went out there to uh, create this work. Um, the Biennale opened, and as it was opening, it was shutting down very, very quickly because Tom Hanks brought COVID to Australia. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> and um, the it was it was such an unknown time. Um, believe that I stopped in Hawaii and was there for a week or something, kind of stuck. But um, the pandemic was more than three weeks, um, as promised. We were, we were told it would be two weeks or something. Uh, and in 2021, I was invited to do a project for Davidson College in North Carolina. Um, this is Catawba. Catawba Territory, and um, I couldn't really be out there for the project. It was a year-long piece. It was supposed to be a year-long piece of outdoor work, uh, and a new version, I wouldn't even say it's a version, a new piece in the same vein of this conversation of land and monuments um, took place, and this work titled Unshadowed, Unshadowed Land, it's a year-long outdoor work in conjunction with many community parties, including the Catawba Cultural Center. Over the next year, this exposed soil in the form and size and shape of the Andrew Jackson Monument at Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. was transformed into a garden. Members of the Davidson community worked with the citizens of the Catawba Indian Nation and their Food Sovereignty Working Group to plant Catawba corn in its silhouette. Unshadowed land is an antithesis to monument celebrating genocide and enslavement. Instead, it invokes the intersection between these expressions of white supremacy, culminating in gestures of acknowledgement, healing, and reconciliation. This work is an unshadowing of land, bringing to light the injustice of settler history, of the Carolinas, and a move toward cultivation and celebration of indigenous connection to land and continuum of ancestral knowledge. It's an outgrowth of past, current, and ongoing anti-racist work to consider the college's history and establish reciprocal, respectful relationships with native people in the region, including Catawba. The corn that was planted in this work is, was thought to have been lost. It was a medicinal Catawba strain. And um, uh, it was later found in the culture community there is still trying to harvest this seed and 
to bank it and continue to be able to grow it. So with with the college, um, you can see this transformation of, of growing and, and this work representing that growing something like this in the in the shadow of the colonial monument. Um, obviously, that's a small footprint. So the agriculture department of the university also grew on their lands a larger bank of this strain of corn. Um, the corn, of course, was harvested at the end of this year-long project, and the community was fed it. Um, some of the Catawba tribal members said this was the first time that they were able to taste uh, this strain of this, this ancestral sustenance. So, been doing some work around land, been doing some work around connection to land. Um, we've been doing some work around our uh, colonial histories and navigating our relationship to, to land. Uh, in 2018, I believe, I was invited to uh, Palm Springs to do a project with Desert X Biennial. Um, I get to visit these communities and, and I get to kind of get an understanding of, of um, chosen narratives of history versus actual histories of, of place. Um, oftentimes, like in my community in Sitka, there's a marketed history um, and one that the commerce in our community used to love to market was the Russian history, trying to differentiate themselves from um, other communities that also had indigenous representation, identity, and histories. Uh, of course, in marketing that Russian history, they completely ignored our 15,000 plus years of connection to that place. Um, erasure, this is a conversation about erasure. Uh, in Palm Springs, it's Agua Caliente, um, Lujia territory, and a marketed version of that was also Bob Hope's um, Hollywood retreat to get away from an industry. Uh, in this case, an industry that has heavily misrepresented indigenous communities, has heavily represented indigenous uh, stories uh, still to this day. Uh, I know if some of you are familiar with Reservation Dogs, my friend Sterling Harjo's celebrated work um, is one of the rare versions of indigenous voices being held and uplifted in that space. Um, historically, Hollywood land, the iconic Hollywood sign, was a real estate advertisement uh, on indigenous land uh, that was erected to market segregated white only uh, real estate buyers to market towards them. And of course, later the word land was removed from Hollywood sign and it still stands to this day as an icon of sorts to an industry that has misrepresented our voices and our histories. I wanted to do a project with this, and I proposed this crazy idea, as it usually starts, and um, no real um, throttle for scale, or cost, or, or reality of, of what it might take, and um, they wanted to go through with it. But we had to wait, so we postponed the project for three years and sought for support. Uh, during that time, I believe I was awarded an Open Society Fellowship, and my dear friend Rashida at the time um, also wanted to help seek support for this project. Uh, and we started finding ways to make it a reality. Uh, I believe this was put up in 2021. I'm not certain right off the hand back, but um, 
to scale. So these letters, you can see there's somebody standing kind of to the left there, and they're way in front. These letters are 44 feet tall, um, but they're also up on scaffolding, so it's probably 60 something at the height, 360 or so in length. Um, this work is not really necessarily about this sign itself. This work was a call to action. Um, as we see increasingly how popularized land acknowledgements become in institutional space and protocol, um, this work acknowledges that we need action over acknowledgement, period. When we're talking about indigenous communities, we're talking about our land, we're talking about Every aspect of that, and this this goes beyond this work. This goes to museums that hold the same, same objects I was telling you about. They, the, the responsibility of those institutional spaces is not just to acknowledge, but to care, to properly care for the objects in those collections, is to return them, to properly, properly care for those objects, is to care for the communities that have created and created that culture. Uh, and that's what the future of any museum institution will need to become if they want to survive. Uh, this work, if you can get past the, the grand scale and size of it, was really about the call to action. Uh, part of the project was, and this is a reference to the land back movement, uh, the increasingly shrinking access to our water, our land, and our resources via colonial and settler government, pushing our ecosystems to the brink of collapse, air quality is diminishing, care for, again, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of connection is really truly understanding what and where we can care for these places and spaces and this land. Uh, land is sovereign. Work with Native American Land Coalition, I believe that's what it's NALC, um, as a form of, uh, I guess the real, pro the real ask in this project was to call for all settler landowners to return title, legal title of their land back to indigenous care. Um, that's not true sovereignty, it's still in this space and in this government, but it is a form of at least caring for a place uh, in important ways that everybody benefits from. Um, nobody participated in that, ask, <laughs> but if you search for hashtags, you'll find all the selfies that were, you know. <laughs> And that was part of the project. It was a documentation demonstration of willingness for communities to put themselves in the work through algorithm. Uh, in this case, it was an infiltration of algorithm, I believe, in that aspect. The other ask is if you couldn't or didn't have legal title or deed to land that you'd like to return, you could participate in monetarily by donating to the Goodwill Fund. We have a photo of that, so there we are. Um, that benefits NALC's uh, mission of acquiring uh, and supporting purchase of sacred sites. Um, Never forget was the title of, of, of this work, by the way. So this is behind my own studio, this, this drawing here, and I wanted to share it, as I mentioned, where I showed you the upside down photograph of the reenactment of the exchange of, of um, the exchange of Alaska, um, unseated from Russia to the US, that took place on that hill there where the flag is now in that image. Um, and that upside down image was the same space. Um, there used to be a Clinket clan house up there that was removed. This Russian um, home was placed up there 
people call this hill Castle Hill still. I think it's burnt that home down. Um, and this is a blockhouse that I believe was rebuilt. Um, and uh, it was a Russian blockhouse behind my son's preschool is where it stands right now. Um, there was a wall in Sitka that was placed from that, separating our, our tribal community. Um, and you can see some of that wall on this image here coming down the hill there. Um, a top of the, on top of that wall were these blockhouses where the Russians would oversee and watch the community. Obviously the cannons were pointed at our indigenous uh, clan houses and um, that brings us to conversations of, in every language there is land, Kata Lengua, Ayala, Tierra. Um, Nicholas invited me here to come look at some sites. I don't know when now, a few years ago. And um, there was uh, conversations about a project that, and the first place I gravitated towards was outdoor work at the site. Um, I feel like this work created out of Cortan steel, diverted from the US Mexico construction that still continues. Um, was an important conversation to have here, and it still is extremely relevant today, as we uh, can see when we turn on our smartphones and, and see what's going on around this world globally. Um, it's an important conversation to bring this scale and this material um, here to this community. Uh, I wanted to share that image of that Russian wall built in our community uh, and relationship to uh, Wall Street and the history of Lenape being also known, uh, one of the first walls I would say built here in the U.S. Uh, and excluding and keeping out Lenape community from their ancestral homelands, um, as well as the British, which is understandable. <laughs> um, languages, for me, this piece is really about language in a lot of ways also. I look at language, uh, purposefully choosing two colonial languages for the title of this work, uh, highlighting all of the languages that this wall separates and has separated through colonization, through removal the removal of our indigenous tongues, the borders and communities that this wall cuts through as it's being, still being built, uh, is also represented in the languages that we speak. It's represented in English on this side, it's represented in Spanish on the other side. I think there's a lot of history in, in, in these things. And connection, language is deeply connected to land. The physical experience of the work embodies the experience of rights and privileges easily unseen to those afforded them and consistently visible to those excluded. The work protests barriers obstructing the movement of all life connected to and dependent on the land. In every language there is land in cada lengua hay tierra formerly repurposes pop arts, use of repetition, industrial production, and text to focus on continued construction of division and control packaged as a necessity for mass consumption. The work's title is a challenge to remember land is sovereign in itself, not defined by language, and a reminder that indigenous people persist perme permeating colonial borders despite the forcible removal of rights, languages, and access to land and water. Uh, Nicholas, thank you so much for um, really beautiful and inspiring kind of walk through some of your projects. There's so many more um, that uh, that you've you've created over an already amazing 
career, um, and this is just the visual art side. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> is that an offer? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, but really, uh, I know I speak for all of us at Public Art Fund to, uh, to say what a pleasure and privilege it's been to work with you. Um, you your, uh, your brilliance and imagination and determination is, is inspiring in itself. Um, but you're also just a, a wonderful collaborator and have been incredibly generous in uh, so many ways, uh, including tonight and, and sharing this uh, with all of us. So, uh, so on behalf of everybody here, um, thank you for the incredibly important work you're doing, um, for, for taking on the challenge of, of creating this work. Uh, and I'm excited to, uh, to continue to see the amazing things you do. Um, Nicholas Glennon, thank you. Thank you.